Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, thanks for coming for this session. And uh, today we have such a wonderful, wonderful people for this ocean conservation issue so that I'm going to uh, speak the least. And um, well, the ocean conservation issue is getting really important these days. And the G1 has established the um, uh, sustainable Ocean and Fisheries think tank a few years ago, and I've been organizing it together with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Fumiyaki Kobayashi, the Vice Minister of the Digital Agency. And so it's a very important conversation today, and thank you very much for coming, everybody. And to start with, um, maybe Dr. Uh, Yamauchi Aiko-san, uh, could you explain what's going on? Because then, uh, we all know that the uh, ocean is in danger now, and, and especially the stock status of the fish uh, seafood is getting worse and worse. So what's going on? Thank you, Minako-san. Yes, yeah, so before the overviewing, that are what is going on in Japan. I just wanted to share a little bit about the, where the global ocean conservation is now facing up. So we all are sharing the challenges that are the, in a global level, that a fish stock is in a critical situation. And on the other hand, even though we have the really good science management measures, but still we are suffering from the having illegal, unreported and unregulated fisheries is acting on the global ocean. So these two are the major concerns that we are having and we're sharing as a global challenge with, it, of course, the other panelists today. And this is where we want, I'd like to um, uh, the focus the when I'm sharing the overview of what's happening in Japan. So within this context, um, I could say I'm seeing the great progress in the last few years in Japan, which was a significant, even for the last two decades, I would say. So one is that we saw that the fisheries law had been a reform, which is a foundation of the, our the national fisheries management system. And which we haven't seen, it's been an updated for the last 70 years, seven zero, not the 17, which is a significant thing that we could achieve and a few years ago. And the, after that reform was adopted, we're seeing a lot of a progress on that implementation process. So where do we are now when we see that a fisheries management system in an international level? So I would say there was three key areas that I can emphasize on where we had a great improvement through that fishery law, um, the reform. And one is the sustainable fishery management system. Maybe this sounds a little bit weird, but even um, for the last 70 years, but until that we got this reform, uh, we have never saw that the terms are saying, clearly saying, we're going in it to um, aiming for the sustainable fishery management in Japan. It was a quite a vague and an opaque, um, the wording was the used in that at the national regulations. So, which means that all the multi stakeholders were not quite to the, on the same page when we say what sort of sustainable fishery reform, I mean, the fishery management could be. But after that reform happened in 2018, now we all share that it was the goal should be, and by when and we have to get reach to that goal. I would say now that sustainability is we have them, we all the fish stocks needs to achieve the maximum sustainable yield level. This is a quite a technical term, but it, when I could easy to say, maybe the fish stock, even when we catch that or the fish from that the whole the group, but it's still that a fish can reproduce well to, um, to be the resilient <laughs> enough for it to uh, the reproduce it in the water. And the second thing is that a second on the good area, key areas that we had seen in a reform is I would say, the sound science-based approach. This is a quite important, in particular, not only for that we talk about the inside the Japan, but also that we share the experience with outside of the Japan expertise. Of course, there's no perfect science. We don't see the hundred percent of perfect science at a time. But even though there's some global um, 
the understanding, we always need to align with the best available science when they're trying to establish the rules among the multi-stakeholders. So within this process, so now that are the, the 200 species, which is a code by the Japanese water, I mean, the Japanese fishermen, is now under the, the sound of the science-based stock assessment process, which is a huge thing that we had been changed because even the consumer can understand at a glance if that are this, this fish is a sustainable or not, with the seeing of that at a stock status. So we could say, yes, that's almost at a, in the level of sustainability, or maybe we could say, no, this fish have some trouble to be in, in the sustainable level, but in this new reform of the fishery law, there's that are clearly stated that if that are the fish stick, I mean, the fish stock is not in a good shape, we have to achieve that at the sustainable level re rebuilding to achieve it in 10 years. So this is, as I said in the previous um, the areas, this is a very important because we all have the, the same goal, where to go and by when to go. So that this only the, um, the realize that by that having this science-based approach. And the third one is that we get a bit easier system to having the new entity for the fishing community. So as you can see it in Japan, and in particular with the coastal area, we have a long history of having this community developed. Uh, the, their, um, the social foundation with the, uh, the coastal little, little fishing stocks. So, uh, which means that the, this community had a really, really great, important key role sort of, to play when we managed that the fisheries. But now under this sort of new, um, the reform, the fishery law, or that it, the sequenced, um, the, the developed the framework, where now to have the more the stakeholders can intervene in this process. And also if you wanted to challenge that the fishing activities, you would have a more opportunity than before, if you be it responsible enough. So these are the three key areas that we see as that are some significant outcomes from the reform and it will see still that it's now they're improving. But I would say, always that are not that are the perfect, but still we have, we also facing that are the some challenges that are to proceed at this improvement process. So I would say the challenges is that all around the capacity building. Maybe Maria and or the child son had the similar understanding. Capacity building is always a challenging when you wanted to have the really good system in place. So for the case in Japan, I would say that there are sort of three areas that we needed to be really carefully um, in, I would say invest to have the really good capacity building. One is that of course the science provider. As I said, it's science-based approach and then we took the really science-based um, the management framework being an established, which means that scientists that it's a workload is in a more and in a more increasing than ever. As I said, 200 species are now under the stock assessment. So all the scientists are being and collecting their effort into the one work that it how to manage this system and what would be the best way to um, the manage uh, the fishing activities to achieve that are the sustainable fishing stock status in the next 10 years. So which means that, uh, um, that there's that are not only for the, the hens on the deck, but also there needs to be knowledge improvement maybe needs to sharing that all the experience with the EU or the US or the other countries expertise and then also um, to have the really one framework or the one methodology is how that the maximum sustainable yield can be estimated with the certain, um, the given the, uh, the data or even when I say that it's science providers capacity building, this is on, not only for the scientists, but also the scientists needs to hold the really good robust data from the fishing community. So how we really can get this information to have the science, sound science-based management approach. So this is also the science area is one of the key areas. I think we need to invest in to have the really good capacity building for the future work. And also second is that a fishing community. As I said, 
we needed more and more understanding on the uh, or the cooperation from the fishing community to proceed this in a new management framework. But still, that as I said, this is a little bit the technical. So quite new. Some some elements are quite new mm -hmm. to the fishing community or the fishermen to understand in a short time. So how we really can only have those understanding by the fishing communities to um, feel the benefit from this new framework or that how we can only ask them to participate in this new framework. To have this, I mean that it, we cannot just rely on the fishermen, fishing community to oh, do something. You better understand these materials, but that's not the way that it works. I think this is everywhere in the world. But we needed to have the really good educational system, or to how we really can in the, the deliver or that the, the communicate the system to the fishermen, which is a quite understandable way by the fishermen. The third area I would say is. Uh, monitoring and control in surveillance. So when we have that at a really good framework, it's not just a framework, but uh, we're asking the fishermen to report back or that we need, we're asking the fishermen to follow that are more the strict rules maybe. In particular, if we, uh, if we transited to having the more and more the total allowable catch framework, which is a call that is a TAC in technical word. This is added to allocate the, the, how much you know quantity of the catch that each vessels can have. So when it comes to the, into into force, of course someone needs to check that how much you fish that you know the fishermen caught at a time. But we don't have much capacity to it, or that how we can you know the verify that their catch or the verify the data from the fishing community. That is some areas that are, I think we're facing as a challenge. But the good things that on the other hand, I wanted to emphasize there's one more other progress that we would like to emphasize is that uh, we are now having the seafood import control rules was adopted by, um, by the Japanese government in the last year. This is sort of the really specific measures that are to address the IUU issues where the global I mean, the global communities that are trying to eliminate. So still, this um, the work is under development. So a lot of things that are needs to be, needs to be to the get work done um, before the implementation. But I would say still, even it's not yet implemented, but that this is a great significant outcomes by the Japanese government that they are now crystal clear with their our position and their position, what our position, I would say. Um, we're just to say clearly said a no to the IUU fisheries. We said we gave the clearly no as a market country to have the IUU seafood. So maybe the regulation is under development, but this message I believe is a quite strong that to have the international arena as a collaboration in the end. So which is that quite important to have the how we can harmonize our activities or the how we can harmonize that our majors on a this uh, tackling with the anti uh, uh, tackling with the IUU fishers using the import control rules with the EU and the US and of course that to have the support from that are the export countries. Wow, thank you so much for such a crystal clear explanation about what's going on in Japan at the moment and the world. Um, well, we're actually at this crucial moment of the, such a revolutionary moment for the fishery reformation, but this is not just like a restriction, but this is the reformation for the uh, economic growth. I would understand that. And uh, let's ask Maria. Uh, she is such an iconic uh, figure of, uh, in the ocean conservation um, society uh, who has achieved the economic growth, which is called blue growth in the EU um, countries as the uh, former EU commissioner for maritime affairs and fisheries. Maria, uh, the stage is for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minako-san. So I would like to first to start by agreeing with Aiko-san. What she said about the global situation is 100% true. We all know that fish has no passport, so it moves and the management of fisheries is an international issue. We, we don't have a global system yet, but this cannot be an alibi 
for all of us not to take the necessary measures to bring uh, back uh, fish to resilient levels. And I'm very happy that uh, Japan has made a great progress, as we have already heard. And in cooperation with the uh, European Union and the United States, I think we can put the, the bar very, very high. Because we need all these measures and we need to do our best to, to do our job in our own countries or at the regional level to uh, persuade, let me put that way, the fish to survive. So from my experience, and I would like to refer to that, if you want really to take measures and do your best, you need, uh, let me put it, three factors to be there. You need good legislation, and I'll explain what I mean with that. You need uh, an implementation mechanism that can bring fruit, and then you need perhaps some intervention to um, global markets and import-export system. So let me start with legislation. What I mean uh, when I'm saying that you need good legislation, I mean that this legislation has to be science-based. I have nothing to add to what Aiko San already said. Uh, she made my life easier. Uh, second, you need uh, transparency. The more transparent the legislation is, the citizens who are going to get involved, they are going to be persuaded to make good choices. So this will be great. And then, of course, you need teeth. What I mean by teeth, a legislation has to be serious, very well defined, and with uh, all the measures that are there and the um, resources that are needed to be implemented. And then about the implementation mechanism, I would like to say that you need also three very, very important uh, factors to be there. Capacity building. Uh, here again, Aiko Sam said everything. You need cooperation with the good guys, the fishermen who would like to work with you, the associations, the civil society. You need this cooperation in order to persuade them to work with you, to motivate them to do their best. And then, of course, what uh, you need is to connect with all this great revolution that is happening right now, because the new technology uh, means that we have in place and we can use. And I would like to refer just two of them. First, now we have satellites, and satellites can give us images at a real time. You can see what's happening. And I can say to you that as a member of the Global Fishing Watch Board, I can see what is there, and it's fantastic. Uh, the European Union has not fully adopted all these new tools yet, but I hope that Japan, with a great tradition in technology and the very advanced technology, can join there. And the second uh, very, very important sector is electronic monitoring on the vessels. So the combination of images and electronic monitoring on the vessels can do the best. And we have found that during the pandemic because it was not easy for inspectors to go on the ship to inspect what was going. But if you have electronic monitoring systems there, then the li everybody's life would be in, uh, easier. So one last point, uh, I, have, uh, I have spoken a lot. Uh, one last point about markets. What I found out uh, when I was a commissioner is that if we can block the imports from the countries that are not cooperating and you suspect that there is illegal fishing behind, you can take a, a great step forward. It's not easy. USA has not uh, adopted a similar system because it's very, very hard. And uh, as the system has to be implemented properly, but it can do miracles. Just to give you an example, <coughs> as a commissioner, I tried for more than five years, four years to persuade a big country uh, near you to go, um, uh, I mean, with sustainable measures. The day that I blocked the imports from them, the second day the legislation was in the parliament. So this can do a, a lot, but it's very difficult to implement. Thank you again. Thank you very much to giving me the opportunity to come in.
Well, thank you so much, uh, Maria. It's such a privilege for us to have you here. And also, again, that um, uh, both Aiko and Maria uh, mentioned about the science and that the science matters. And also the a new collaboration of the progressive collaboration of the stakeholders is going to be very important for us. And, uh, and Charles, I'd like to hear about your opinion as the uh, editorial director of the Economist Group. And also, you're uh, uh, a very important person as the founder of the World Ocean Summit as well, Charles. Naka, thank you very much indeed. And uh, it really is a great uh, honor and pleasure to be part of this year's uh, G1 Summit. Thank you so much for uh, inviting us along. Uh, I'm not going to disagree with Maria or Aiko. I think those were both extraordinarily well put uh, uh, thoughts around the really big issues concerning fisheries. And of course, fisheries and sustainable fisheries is a fundamental part of getting the blue economy right. And uh, I just thought I'd have a word or two about uh, that. And, in, and indeed, one of the reasons why we started the World Ocean Summit in 2012, all the way back in 2012, um, was really... Uh, a, noticing that the global discussion on the ocean was particularly fragmented. Um, uh, scientists were in one corner, the policymakers were all talking to themselves, and the businesses uh, were talking in completely separate verticals, and nobody was speaking to each other. So we, we felt there was a, a moment in which uh, a brand like ours could bring all of those uh, groups together. And of course, we had written, more importantly, we'd written in The Economist, I think, uh, about how distressed uh, the ocean was from all of the cumulative pressures of human activities, from pollution, from industrialization, uh, shipping ports and fishing and other extracted industries, as well as, of course, uh, from the devastating, as we were just beginning to understand it then, the devastating impacts of climate change on the ocean as well. Uh, and we wanted to address that global public policy challenge um, uh, and the economics of that challenge, the tragedy of the commons of that challenge, in a sense, by asking how human activities in the ocean uh, could be made more sustainable and how our activities could be in balance uh, with an ocean that is in thriving health rather than an ocean that's in uh, long-term decline, which effectively is what it was. And unfortunately, I think in some ways it still is. Um, and I, I have to say that, you know, eight, nine years on since that conversation started, it has changed immeasurably. Um, and I, I hope we've played a small part in that. But really, I think it's been the work of many, many different national, international uh, and supranational organizations uh, and individuals, countless NGOs, such as the ones you're working with, uh, Minaco, um, uh, the European Union, um, Maria's uh, Blue Growth Plans, right at the very early stages of those plans, uh, I think fundamentally led the way from a, a policy perspective. Um, uh, and, and certainly the European Commission was one of the first to characterize the sort of the old industries and the new industries um, in, uh, in the blue economy. And I think that was really an important point. We had to transition the old industries from unsustainable activities and then look at how the new industries, industries like bioprospecting, sustainable tourism, sustainable aquaculture, uh, all of those new industries could potentially help restore uh, the health of the ocean and help uh, build a sustainable ocean economy. Uh, in Japan, of course, we had the Ocean Policy Research Institute, uh, which uh, Tsunami-san was, uh, was, was with um, as part of the SPF, getting an ocean law passed, and most recently the work of the High Level Panel on a Sustainable Ocean Economy, which uh, uh, of which Japan's Prime Minister is one of the 14 uh, leaders pushing for action globally to build a more sustainable economy. And I think the collective action that's now been happening over the last 10 years, over the last decade of all of these things is now broadly accepted. Uh, it's broadly accepted across governments and across businesses uh, and to some degree uh, investors that the ocean really is a critical planetary system. It's uh, something that we can no longer treat with impunity and treat as a dump, uh, which we have been doing for a very long period of time. But what do we, I mean, to do that, I mean, obviously we need some coherent plans and we need to think about how we're going to manage the ocean in a sustainable way. 
Uh, and quite a few countries now, I think we're really beginning to see some movement uh, in the right direction, but arguably rather like climate change and rather like biodiversity loss, I think we're seeing a huge, we still, there's a very, very long way to go. Um, uh, and that there is a still a strong tendency, I think, for prioritizing economic development over sustainable economic development. Uh, and the recovery uh, from uh, the pandemic, of course, the Build Back Better uh, uh, admonitions from all governments uh, uh, really have not materialized in the way that we would hope that they would. Um, and I think we're just still putting a lot of money and investment back into relatively unsustainable activities rather than really sustainable activities. So I think in conclusion, I would just say that there are sort of four areas that I think we need to sort of look at for this broad transition and I, I'm not saying anything new here because of course a lot of this has been set out most recently in the high level panel I think really really brilliantly uh, and of course Maria has been part of that process but we've all been in one way or another been part of that process um, but I think uh, countries the first one is countries need to have a national strategy on the ocean um, to protect and manage their ocean spaces uh, um, and, uh, of course, with the aim of balancing the health of the ocean with the economic activities that they want to create in those. And the European Union is certainly a long way down that road, although still has a way to go. The UK, the US and others are beginning to do so. But there are many countries that haven't yet done this. Um, the high level panel suggested that by 2030, all countries should have uh, a national ocean strategy. And I believe Japan is also now building, uh, building that strategy out of its uh, Ocean Policy Act. Um, the second thing is governance, governance, governance. And I know, I'm, I hope Maria would agree with, agree with me here. I mean, strong governance is absolutely essential to uh, fully and effectively managing spaces. And at the moment, we don't really, uh, we still have a lot of fragmentation in the governments of the ocean at, at the national level and at the international level. Um, and countries, mi different ministries have different responsibilities over different aspects of ocean, uh, of ocean activities and conservation. And what, what, what is really needed is a much greater level of coordination to bring all those together. And then the third thing is, I mean, this has been mentioned by both Aiko and, uh, and Maria, science and data are absolutely essential. If we can't, if we don't have that, we're not going to be able to manage the ocean spaces that, uh, in the way that we would want to. And then the fourth thing I would mention is that there must be greater public and private sector collaboration, I think. Um, and without that, and without a clear understanding of the need for that, I think that it's going to be extremely difficult for us to, to move towards greater levels of sustainability. And of course, that sustainability, there are cross-cutting themes, many of them, but two of them, uh, importantly, would be the need to create income and create growth and create jobs and equitable growth and, uh, uh, and, and inclusion um, uh, as one of them. And the second, of course, given COP26 is right upon us at the moment, is, um, you know, a healthy ocean is inseparable from a stable climate. We cannot, we cannot, have a healthy ocean without a stable climate. Well, thank you so much, Charles. Um, well, yes, there are many keywords, but including the uh, well, the collaboration of the stakeholders again, and then also uh, the sustainable economic development uh, is a challenge to, uh, that that we all share. Um, and uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Tsunami. That's a she. Um, as the uh, president, you, you have a lot of faces on the internet, and uh, as a president of the Sasaka Peace Foundation and also uh, the professor at the National uh, Graduate Institute of um, Policy Studies, uh, you're expertised in the uh, uh, international politics and so on. Uh, could you um, let me know uh, what, what, what's going on as the policy side, as well as at the space side, as uh, Maria actually um, uh, mentioned about the uh, digitalization and then also EMS and then satellite, which it, is like a sort of the combination of the space and ocean technology. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, in fact, I, last year I came, you know, at the G1 summit or a G1 uh, seminar. I came with the uh, in a session for space policy, and uh, so I'm coming back this year with the ocean. So it is important to have the spatial uh, space and ocean collaboration. Uh, but uh, as uh, my previous speakers have already alluded to, I mean, the uh, science matters and data 
supported by good science, right science matters. And uh, this year, UN Decade of Ocean Science has kicked off and I'm co-chairing the Japan's committee to support this uh, ocean science effort in the, at the United Nations. And uh, we have been discussing how we can, as a Japan, as a, and as with the scientific community to, to collaborate and spearhead the, uh, this movement for the next 10 years. So uh, the, uh, there are a lot of interest, of course, in terms of the, uh, from the science side is to, to create a good science for, um, and what I mean by good science is of course the challenge is science policy nexus. I mean, we have a lot of scientists, we have a lot of scientific activities, but how that relates to good management, good policy decision, that's a challenge. And uh, not only in, in the ocean, but of course, we call it uh, uh, EBPM, evidence-based policy making with the science uh, uh, and, 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 and data providing good evidence. And that, that sort of thing is really transforming way we do government here in Japan. And uh, one of the, Aiko-san mentioned that the recent transformation that Japanese fishing uh, policy is really as a part of this more effort to make it more evidence-based policy making. And, uh, but there are a lot of challenges, of course, uh, in this area. And, uh, uh, and I would uh, also like that the technology matters as Maria, as I alluded to in, our, in a, uh, Maria's speech uh, uh, in a, earlier, that uh, space, uh, utilizing the uh, satellite uh, technology for the uh, space ocean governance is, is going to be a very important. And I'm sitting in the government's uh, uh, policy, uh, space policy committee. And just uh, last week, uh, we discussed the, one of the priorities for Japanese space policy is um, MDA, Marine, uh, Maritime Domain Arenas, by providing the uh, satellite uh, data for the governance of the, uh, the ocean management. And uh, so we have the uh, a plan to, to accelerate uh, smaller uh, micro uh, satellites uh, with a constellation program and to really to make the ocean more visible and transparent. So this would may, should be a way that technology can contribute to the idea of uh, uh, transforming the uh, sustainable uh, to, to fisheries, to uh, sustainable fisheries. And um, also, uh, I wanted to sort of mention that the uh, uh, digital transformation is, is a key. And, 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 and we are in Japan, what we call Society 5.0, which is our, one of our prime, the, sort of the uh, of, uh, main target for uh, technology and innovation. And I, I think other sessions are talking about this uh, a lot, even today uh, here at G1. But uh, we need to think about Society 5.0 over the ocean, right? And uh, we haven't really done much to have the real good uh, dialogue on how we're gonna proceed this society 5.0 covering not, not only the coastal areas, but the ocean uh, and, and, uh, as a system. And uh, we, because we tend to focus a lot on territorial issues and the ocean kinds of left behind in many of the discussions, uh, in, in, but, uh, uh, so we are, are really hoping to, to have not only space technology uh, uh, involved in the ocean governance, but also uh, utilizing other terrestrial uh, digital transformation technologies onto the ocean. And uh, of course, uh, the, the whole idea is the uh, IoT and connectivity. And the connectivity is the point of making the data available and make the whole so fishing management transparent. And all these are good the Japanese government now, as Aiko-san mentioned that, uh, that we uh, started with the TAC and other ways to transform our fisheries into more sustainable fisheries, but uh, we need to have a good data to do that. And uh, this connectivity with the latest technologies like you know, uh, blockchain technologies or the better data management technologies and even the, uh, the, all the small fishing boat can provide the best good information, but how are we gonna collect all these data and make it available to, to better use? And that sort of thing is something that uh, is a challenge, but uh, uh, something that technology, uh, that's why I wanted to mention that technology matters. And lastly, uh, innovation matters, because we, don't, we need to have the right mix of science and technology 
and social interests and and the innovation without innovation there's always as as charles mentioned that they're never be connected i mean we have to bring all these efforts together and uh, and the innovation has to be inclusive and uh, uh, of course uh, maria and uh, uh, minako is, has already started this war a leading woman for the ocean and uh, uh, bringing all the women uh, female leaders to the uh, the, the center of uh, mainstreaming the uh, female voice in the uh, ocean policy di dialogue so i think this sort of inclusiveness into in bringing the innovation to a new level that would uh, would probably uh, create uh, some sort of uh, the real transformation of uh, making the uh, uh, blue economy uh, uh, and transformation to sustainable blue economy. So I let me stop here for now. Well, thank you so much indeed. Um, the, actually, that you mentioned about the science policy nexus, that was actually the theme of the, the uh, FAO two years ago in Rome. And so it's kind of the worldwide uh, theme at the moment. And thanks for mentioning about the leading women for the ocean that we have probably like 10 minutes to go for the Q&A. So uh, just quickly, can I ask Maria about leading women for the ocean movement? Because I think it's really important to raise awareness and how to communicate with the audience. Yes, I'm so happy that Atush mentioned that this uh, network because actually it started in Japan. We have made it Ikea Abe, uh, Minako and me, we have started it, but now it's spread worldwide. We have very important ladies uh, joining, including Kathy Machue, who is there, if I got it right, and other important, uh, like Ingrid Van Wies, the vice president of the Asian Development Bank. Uh, we have great ladies upon and we are looking forward. The idea is that uh, the gender also matters, referring to all issues, so women can bring their own view, referring to um, the ocean conservation, and we have already taken great initiatives. What I would like just to mention is that we sent this letter that made some impression to uh, Gozo Iwevala, the, the leader of WTO, who is also a very important woman, a Nigerian woman, about fishery subsidies. So we have done a lot, and I hope we can do more in the future. So I would like to urge uh, important, more important women for Japan to join our our network. Thank you, Minako. Well, thank you so much, Maria. Perhaps the uh, the audience here in the G1 uh, Global, uh, if you're interested in, please uh, let us know. And also, um, well, there's an, another powerful woman here, Aiko San, as the uh, the uh, member of the Fishery Policy Council of the Ministry, uh, the Fishery Agency, that you've been working together with the government a lot. And then also you're the key person of the anti-EU forum. Uh, could you explain briefly about it? I'm sorry for such a short notice in the short time frame. So yes, I would love to introduce the anti-IUU Forum Japan, which is that I think a very first the formal coalition of NGO and the social organization based in Japan, because we all have the common um, the agenda to eliminate the IUU fisheries. So now that the five, we started from the seven organization maybe, but it is somehow we move it in and out. I mean, if, if now five organization is working together really together um, to not only to make the policy advocacy, but also for the engaging the market Almost people. every day, yes. Yes, every day, <laughs> yes. Thank you for joining. So I, I'm just a coordinating, I'm just a coordinator for that coalition. So actually Minako-san is uh, quite actively working on the policy, um, the part the to advocate the to the important people, yes. Thank you so much. And also the Atsushi's organization that you've been uh, doing a lot for the ocean conservation issue with the uh, ocean, Research Institute. Yes, um, the one of the things that we are now working on is to create the Japanese version of the uh, blue ocean, a uh, blue bond, uh, or social impact investment uh, mechanism for um, a sustainable coastal and uh, fishery management. And uh, and also we like to see more young uh, entrepreneurs and startups. Uh, coming into the uh, uh, area of, I mean, I see on the, uh, in a parallel, but I mean, on, on the other hand, I see a lot of uh, enthusiasms in the space uh, space area 
for a lot of young entrepreneurs and others coming in. And I want to see that sort of dynamism, the excitement for the ocean uh, part as well. So they, in order to support that, we are talking about creating the uh, social investment, uh, social impact investment uh, program uh, for the ocean. So. Thank you so much. And then Charles, finally, um, lastly, but most importantly, that we are going to host the uh, 2025 Osaka Expo in Japan after this Tokyo Olympic Games. And uh, what would you expect us to achieve there? What to tackle? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, left field question. I, I mean, I hope, uh, certainly in Osaka being a coastal city, I hope that there is uh, going to be a focus around how potentially cities can adapt themselves, particularly cities that have been heavily industrialized in the past and which are looking to re reinvent themselves, reframe themselves as new economies, also look in particular at the way in which they develop their blue economy uh, and the way in which the city and ocean interface works, uh, both from an economic point of view, but also from the point of view of how the city identifies itself with the ocean, because Osaka has, of course, long been identified with the ocean in many ways, but uh, perhaps uh, re-identifying itself with the ocean in new ways, uh, in ways which are sustainable, I think would be an enormously interesting way for part of the ocean, or uh, part of the expo at uh, Osaka to be framed, I think. Um, Maria, any message for us? Japan is a great country, doing a great progress, but we need more. We need more, both at national and international level. And I think everybody knows the way forward, but we have, how can I say, to think a little bit about our conflicts, to leave them aside and try to do more about creating bridges uh, uh, between different countries. Otherwise, as we can see COP, in Glasgow right now, we are going to fail. Yes, well, thank you so much. And uh, well, in uh, in detail that, you know, like a catch documentation scheme, for example, that the EU country has already achieved for the every species, I call that right? And then uh, so the US is now achieving the uh, 13 species, but uh, they, they have this new uh, law uh, past the diet. Uh, uh, the law no, is going to pass that right, right for the every species that that is what we're going to follow and probably we can coordinate everything together uh, for the better future for the better world um, and I think we're about the time for uh, the Q&A session um, anything uh, anything from the floor Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all of your efforts on behalf of the ocean. I've got four children and I hope to have grandchildren and I really do believe that without a healthy ocean we have no future on the planet. Um, one thing, Japan is, is, oh, is a wonderful country. There are over one, I think 1100 marine protected areas in Japan. And there's been great efforts um, made to conserve and to provide conservation areas. I would like to see more of that. I do have one question though. Um, I didn't hear any mention at all from the fishing perspective about a transition to clean fuels and zero emissions for fishing fleets and the shipping industry. The shipping industry is responsible for more than 3% of global emissions, and I would imagine that also incorporates shipping, um, fishing fleets. This is a very, very important issue that Japan could lead on, and uh, a transition to EV for fishing fleets and giving incentives to fishermen to go not only to just very low sulfur fuels, but also to electric engines. Zero emissions is possible. And also there was no mention of plastics. Microplastics is a tremendous issue. There've been studies in Japan where 100% of the fish stocks tested and contained microplastics. These are now being found in 100% of the umbilical cords of human babies that are being born. This is a tremendous issue for the planet. Microplastics have to be solved and um, Japan is a major producer of plastics. And in terms of ocean uh, conservation, we're going to have more plastic than fish in the sea by 2050. 
according to the World Economic Forum. So I would just like to, um, if there's any comments on that, the emissions for, um, and any plans in Japan to make um, fishing emissions, zero emissions and plastics. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful question. Um, well, actually, you, you should rather come in here <laughs> as a panelist. Um, but uh, anybody who wants to talk, uh, talk about the uh, maritime um, emission and the plastic pollution? Yes, please. Yes, as a um, yeah. part of um, the Nippon Foundation. Uh, the, uh, as you know, the Japanese government uh, has had this uh, started this general emission uh, project and uh, and especially for technology and innovation and what we call GI fund, which is Green Innovation Fund, which is quite a huge fund that actually uh, under the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry and, and NEDO. And within this program, there is a one uh, particular uh, section on the uh, uh, transforming the shipping uh, technology into, and one area of course is looking at the hydrogen and, and use, util, utilizing hydrogen directly in the in the combustion system, and I, I mean that sort of new technologies has been discussed, and now I think there will be a uh, hopefully uh, some outcomes work from from this kind of innovation fund, uh, and that would lead the Japan into this new area. And thank you for asking that question. And also the uh, plastics, the uh, my brother foundation, the uh, Nippon Foundation, for instance, has a big program on on measuring. What microplastics uh, in the inter Setouchi inter inland sea area with the four five uh, prefectural that are surrounding this area with the cooperation with JAMSTEC and uh, University of Tokyo and other experts and the data just coming out I think is more very recently and I it was quite shocking what I heard yes so uh, these we need a science we need to have the data to tell the people that what we are facing. And, and with there are a lot of studies has to be done on microplastics and, and so on and so forth. At the, and that may change the behavior and even more the sort of the direction, the investment of the companies that are involved in this area. So, Thank you, Atsushi. Perhaps one more person, uh, Maria, that you're also wearing a lot of hats. And one of that is the uh, board member of the uh, Prince Albert Du Foundation of Monaco. Um, uh, they are keen on the um, maritime issues as well, the plastics, yeah. pollutions. Yeah. They, they, they are having a great program uh, trying to gather plastic from the Mediterranean and also recycling and uh, find solutions. But what I would like to, to say, uh, answering to th that great question uh, is that um, if we really need to have uh, results about the plastic, we have to work with the private sector. So my experience in Europe, but also in USA is that a lot of things changed since the big corporates came in, creating an alliance about gathering and recycling the plastic. We can motivate people, especially young people, school students to do that, but it is important to engage the private sector if we really want results. My other comment will be about uh, the shipping and uh, the fossil fuels used in shipping. This is really a great tragedy. But what we really need is an international decision on that. Because as you know, IMO has not taken a decision yet. And I'm afraid that in Glasgow, this is I, I can express my disappointment even from now. I cannot see any concrete decisions about abandoning fossil fuels. Of course, hydrogen power is still very expensive, so they have their uh, alibis, but what we have to do is to move forward as the lady mentioned, but it will be a, a target of international cooperation because as you know, the ship owners can change flags like this, can go to another country. So if we don't have an international decision, it will not be easy. Thank you, Minako. Thank you so much, Maria. And uh, yes, Charles, would you like to add? I just, just wanted to add, I mean, I'm, I first of all agree uh, with Minako, uh, sorry, with uh, Maria that um, uh, that the private sector has to be engaged in the plastic discussion and more so than it is now. And that is beginning to happen, I think. But to the point of microplastics and, uh, uh, and, and to the point that uh, 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 was being made earlier about the Nippon Foundation having a, a role in this, we are in fact working with the Nippon Foundation very closely 
uh, around a big project, not only on plastics, we've just released a plastics management index, which is looking at this question of how well or not plastics has been managed in different countries around the world in 25 different countries. But also I think that is looking, our project is going to be looking at the whole question of chemical pollution and microplastics and nanoplastics are intri intricately linked to this question of chemical pollution because they're carriers of chemicals uh, as well as uh, having chemicals embedded uh, in them. And I hope that we'll be able to shed some light in the report that we're releasing in March next year around uh, chemical pollution in the ocean and the role that it plays in degrading ocean systems. And of course, as you pointed out uh, earlier in that good question, in human health uh, and how it impacts uh, how things that we eat from the ocean, things that we do in the ocean, swim and so on and so forth has an impact on human health. So I hope we can shed some more light on that. But much, much more research I think needs to be done on these things because we're only just beginning to uncover just how, uh, how dangerous and potentially damaging uh, chemicals and microplastics are. Yes, thank you very much. This is so important issues. And then those uh, can be discussed further at the, uh, for example, our ocean conference in Palau, uh, February next year. Um, and that sort of thing so that we have a lot of opportunities to uh, discuss the further conversation. And anything else? Yes, please. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you very much, participant, for this great conversation. Uh, uh, but uh, my son's name is Ocean, so uh, I'm really interested in Ocean. And but you know, no one has touched upon the you know uh, the China problem because you know the ocean conservation needs the cooperation, the real cooperation with the other uh, stakeholders. And uh, uh, could you comment on you know the chi China's uh, future behavior or, or what should we do with uh, you know uh, China? So thank you. Thank you. The col global collaboration. Anybody? Maria? Yes. Thank you. This is a really a great question that brought the elephant in the room. So as you said, yes, we have to, <laughs> to, to, to do whatever we can do in order to uh, have cooperation between different uh, countries. And, and I was very uh, happy. I, I was really disappointed because President Xi didn't uh, go to Glasgow. Also, uh, Putin, Mr. Putin, the head of uh, the Russian Empire, <laughs> if I can use this expression, he didn't go to Glasgow. So it's obvious that it will not be easy. And after AUKUS and what is happening there in this area and the geopolitical confrontations, I'm afraid that uh, we have to be calm and uh, try to build bridges between uh, different geopolitical interests. I hope that in Glasgow at the end of the day, uh, there will be a common sense, a sense of survival of humanity that can overpass the geopolitical confrontations, but it is there. I agree with uh, the person who asks, yes, we cannot uh, bring uh, the sustainability back to our seas unless big countries can be fully cooperative and they are not yet there. So the problem of international governance that uh, Charles already mentioned before is there and humanity has to face it. I'm sorry I cannot give a solution, but this is really a big, big problem. Thank you, Maria. And it actually, it again comes back to the sort of uh, communication and the uh, the further communication between the stakeholders. And I co-sign it with the recent experience with the private sector's communication with China that you have a great um, access. Thank you very much, Minako san. Yes, that, indeed, that's true. That uh, when and we see that at uh, the seafood market. It, China and Japan is really close to each other. And then even when we see the fish stocks, we're sharing that the, the target of fish together. So with the, in this sense, we as at a private sector, so that we're trying to have developed some sort of the platform that we can work together, not only for the just with the government, but the more 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 or less with the, the private sector, the stakeholders can achieve that the same, you know, um, the the objectives um, together in the near future. So that's kind of the movement is also starting. Yes. Yeah, it's happening. Yes. Anybody else? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my question to you, uh, Charles and Maria, 
what kind of role you guys are expecting to Japan on this ocean issue? That's a great question. Thanks for raising that. Charles, would you like to start? Uh, thank you. And, uh, it is a great question. And it's, uh, it's a question that we've, uh, as we were hoping to bring our World Ocean Summit to Japan in 2020 with uh, the help of NALCO and many others, including the Sasuke Peace Foundation and the Nippon Foundation, unable to do that, in part so that we wanted to see uh, how and what Japan was doing, but also to sort of engage Japan a little bit more in the whole global ocean dialogue. And I, I, I get the, the impression, and sitting outside of Japan, of course, I get the impression that Japan could be a greater part of that ocean dialogue. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, as, as with COP26 and as with the whole climate change discussion, uh, Japan does, doesn't always take a front seat as it perhaps should do, I think. And uh, there's lots of things that Japan could offer that dialogue. Um, uh, We've got the new fisheries law as one very good example. We've got generally well-managed coastlines and so on and so forth. There's lots of things that could be brought to that discussion. Um, uh, but sometimes uh, my own sense is that Japan sort of sits a little bit in the background. And uh, I, I, I particularly think now that uh, since the high-level panel was convened and Shinzo Abe, the former prime minister, uh, engaged Japan in that process, a real opportunity now for Japan to sort of step forward and uh, and start to to sort of put forward some of the things that I think Japan can in that global discussion, as well as put its own house in order and get some of the national ocean strategy in place, its fisheries reform uh, done, and also start to think clearly about what it means to have a sustainable ocean economy. Thank you, Charles and Maria. Yes, I agree with everything that Charles said. I would like to, to add uh, two uh, dimensions. Referring to the governmental level, Japan can play a very, very important role, first at an international level, but also in stabilizing the whole area around Japan. Japan has some very, very important neighbors, so the government of Japan can play a role of stabilization in the whole area, from Russia to Australia. And uh, this is something that I'm sure that Japanese government has got and is going to date, take the uh, initiatives, appropriate initiatives. Referring to the high level panel that Charles mentioned, I'm very happy to hear from him. I, I'm co-chairing their network and I would like to mention that uh, the high level panel is an initiative of prime ministers, not governments, but prime ministers. So what I can say is that I hope that the new prime minister of Japan will continue this great, great tradition with great measures that can bring us forward. But what I would like to underline more is that the markets the private sector of Japan can play a very, very important role referring to the fish resources because Japan is a great, great consumer of fish and fish products. If we can create an alliance, and this was my ambition and I hope it will happen, between USA, European Union and Japan, we can control the markets so the private sector can play a very, very important role referring to the markets, the IUU, the imports and exports and everything. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Maria. And thank you so much, everybody at the, uh, on the stage. Uh, we have like 15 seconds to, <laughs> to close, but uh, well, Japan is at the very important transitional period for the um, ocean conservation to improve. And the EU, US and everybody is collaborating. Yes, 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 please. Um, just one information that yesterday, I think high level panel met at the Glasgow and uh, Prime Minister Kishida, unfortunately, left before <laughs> the meeting, but he left a message to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the panel. So I think uh, he's committed to participate in the, in the panel. So Great. we look forward to that. Happy to hear. Thank you, Atsushi. Thanks for the latest. And uh, Aiko-san, thank you so much for such a knowledgeable information. And um, we'll all um, agree to collaborate with each other. And thank you so much, uh, Maria from Greece and uh, uh, Charles from Hong Kong. And thank you so much, everybody, to join us for this panel. Thank you. <laughs>